as the next speaker, we are happy to have uh, Giacomo Roati um, reporting on um, a quantum vortex collider and hopefully the, ah, there it is, Captain the Vortex Whisper, that's very poetic. Please stand by. Looks a little bit like the sky this morning, didn't it? You good? It's fine? Okay. All right, take thank it you. away. Okay, so good morning, uh, everyone. I want to join Francesca in thanking the organizer for uh, uh, the possibility and the honor to be here and also to organize the meeting because in, in this way we can meet really a lot of people and discuss about science after quite a while. Um, and I want also to stress that for me it's a particular pleasure to talk after Francesca, given our friendship and uh, collaboration in the past and possibly in, also in the future. So as I said, uh, I'm going to tell you about some experiment that we carried out uh, uh, in Florence uh, on uh, Vortex, in fact, that is uh, with the topic that Francesca touched at the end of her talk. So, uh, before, I would like really to thank all the people working uh, in, the, in this experiment, and in particular, you will see, sorry, the, okay, the, these people here, this, I think that is dying, the, the green laser, but anyway, uh, that are underlined, that are the present, um, that are present also in this, uh, that participate to the work, and the underlined are the ones that actually are also present here, in the, in the audience that now carry, are carrying out uh, research in other, in other places. Well, so, uh, first thing I would like to tell you, just uh, to start from some uh, basic introduction, typically we, we like and we love to find uh, probes or tools that are the less invasive possible, okay, to, to extract and to unveil some properties of a system. And uh, in, well, this is true, uh, of course, uh, in the case of ultra-cold system or in general in, in, in physics, uh, for example, considering transport measurement. And you can see, I mean, you, you have different examples that are uh, clear, I mean, from uh, superconducting transition to Anderson transition and to other spin uh, dynamics that you can have now in system. So my goal is to convince you that, in fact, the study of a dipole propagation, of single vortex dipole propagation in a superfluid is an ideal probe to extract at one veil microscopic dissipative mechanism across the, the whole dc bcs crossover. Okay. Typically, because this is, is not obvious at first order, because uh, typically we, we know that vortex motion in both superfluid and superconductor is associated to dissipation or onset of resistance. And example, for example, are given by phase leapage processes both in helium and in superconducting state. Okay, so. I think that to convince you this, we have to do really a step back and to see things from another perspective than the previous slide that I just showed you. Okay. Um, first of all, I have to introduce in some basic way, of course, the difference between a classical vortex and a quantized vortex. And the main point here is that while classical vortex can have circulation that can assume any value. Of course, in quantized world, this is not possible, and quantized vortices, and vortices must be quantized. Uh, another point that is very interesting, and probably uh, that I want to deliver, is that the way in which vortices can dissipate energy, so can dissipate swirling energy, incompressible energy, in something, is different when we consider classical or quantized vortices. In fact, classical vortices can really lose energy in a continuous way using uh, the viscosity of the typical fluid in which you can see them. While the problem is that how quantized vortices that live inside an unviscid medium can lose energy. Okay, uh, this is not of course something that is only related to cold atoms. This is a very general question that of course uh, was tackled at the beginning in a superfluid helium system. Well, one, typo well, sorry, one possibility is that uh, the interaction of the vortex with the normal component can induce some friction, okay? I don't know if you can see the pointer here, but uh, in, in particular, you have two kinds of forces acting on 
um, a vortex moving in a superfluid, one is really the so-called mutual friction one that will depend from the relative velocity between the vortex and the normal component. And the other one instead is the Magnus force that instead depends just on the superfluid fraction. Anyway, this is, again, is not something related to cold atoms. This is very general, okay? It's a, it's a model, it's a phenomenological model that has been derived for trying to understand what happened in the vortex dynamics. Uh, of course, uh, we expect that this mutual friction should decrease, decreasing, sorry. Let's see. Okay, like here? Super. Okay, yeah. then I, I, I don't, will not start from the beginning anyway. So. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> then there is the possibility for the vortex to lose energy even at t equals zero. Okay, what happened at t equals zero? Well, the fact that the system typically, these superfluids are compressible, give the possibility to access, to change, I mean, to exchange energy between this incompressible, and, uh, incompressible mode that are related to the swirling flow to compressible mode that typical are phonons. Okay, this is a, is a process that should be valued, of course, at equal zero as well. And I want to say, I like that this, is me this mechanism is very fundamental to understand uh, a variety of uh, problems related to Kelvin waves, vortex reconnection, quantum turbulence. And I just list here uh, some of the possibly theoretical work that I access to, but of course there are many. I mean, the literature is very, very, very wide on that. Okay, so just to summarize, to, this was a long introduction, but so we have two kinds of possible uh, mechanisms to lose energy, to, to, to have the, the vortex lose energy, one ties vortex. One is mutual friction that we cannot say that is a finite temperature effect. And then there is also the interaction with sound that should happen also at equal zero. Okay, it's not depending on temperature difference. Uh, so these are typically difficult. Okay, in principle, I made it disentangling them from the point of view of, of, of this uh, presentation, but typically in the experiment are very difficult to disentangle. And my point also here that is more fundamental for, for me is how this, how the superfluid nature from the BCBCS crossover play a role in this, if play any role. In fact, we can have an extra bonus uh, when we consider um, Fermi superfluids, in general, helium-3 superconductor, or can be also, okay, atomic Fermi superfluid, that uh, the vortex core, so the vortex nature is different if we go in the, in the fermionic side, okay? Without entering too much in the detail, but we expect that the vortex core is not depleted. There are quasi-particles that can sit in this underbound state. And this underbound state can give rise when scattered with a part, quasi particle also outside or normal part, or in general, uh, can give rise to extra or different mechanisms for a decay or for dissipation for vortices. Okay, this is quite under debate. I mean, I was reading some, some papers on that. It's not obvious, and for sure there is no clear experimental evidence that this really can play a role. Well, the summary, I will be faster, of course, <laughs> than all the rest that I just said, so uh, we just uh, will give you how we, the idea how we produce an homogeneous quasi two-dimensional Fermi system, and then I will touch uh, the way, the, the, I will touch the points related to uh, the study of this dissipative mechanism in uh, vortex dynamics. How do we do this? This is a very standard, so there are many people in the audience that study lithium-6 atoms, so we have lithium-6, to internal spin state, the lowest we pair, and then we use a flashback resonances to access the BCBCS crossover. And then, of course, what we need is to manipulate and to image the atoms with very high resolution, and this, again, is not something that is new. Uh, it, we do using DMD and a, a high numerical of, uh, microscope objective. Um, so, uh, again, we produce one single, for the experiment that I'm going to tell you, single oblate Fermi superfluid, in the sense that the superfluid is still 3D, quite 3D, but the vortex dynamics is 2D. Okay, and this is, we, we did this because we did not want to enter business of BKT transition because then, of course, it would be interesting to study in this direction, but at the moment we don't want to do that. Okay, how do we produce, uh, and which is uh, um, the way in which can produce vortices? And we took an idea taken by Arizona uh, group uh, in, uh, I think, in 2016, and uh, Brian Anderson group, and we just uh, use uh, the DMD to produce uh, at the beginning, uh, okay, two chopsticks if you want, and we can just move the two chopsticks in the superfluid with a 
certain velocity and a certain angle. In this way, what we create here, this is the in situ with the chopstick on, and this is just after that the chopstick are switched off, automatically, uh, switched off, we have uh, the possibility to create a vortex double. Okay, so we give li linear momentum, not angular momentum, so we have a vortex anti-vortex. And just for the rest of what I'm saying, I don't know if this is a vortex or an anti-vortex. For us, this is not relevant, okay? But for sure, it's a, it's a vortex dipole. And what is important is that uh, this technique uh, can allow us to produce exactly one vortex dipole with a fidelity almost of 100%. Okay, that is really important for us. So we need to have a very reproducible initial condition. Okay, and then this is the, if you want, the, the most arrogant part of my talk, is that what we wanted to do, in fact, with uh, Francesco, Bugin, and Giulia, and the other people of my lab, is to create a really a minimal, minimum scalable, programmable platform to study vortex physics. Okay, if you want, adding and manipulating one vortex by one vortex in the system. Of course, uh, this, and this is my, my, my point of view, the arrogant point of view, this in some way should resemble you what is happening now in an array of Rydberg atoms or neutral atoms, uh, just substituting the single atom with a single vortex. Okay, so our main ingredient is one vortex, not one atom. And in this way, we can really control the, single, the, the physics at the single vortex level. Okay. So let's see why it's important and how the, this change of perspective can help us. Well, because vortex dipole are really self-propelled objects, and the momentum is proportional to the size of the dipole, and the energy is proportional to the log of the dipole size, and this dipole size is very nicely measurable. Okay, so this means that uh, if I measure D, in some sense I have access to some quantity that are that are, that are related to the dipole itself. And I would say that this is really a perfect, gentle probe of microscopic dissipation mechanism without altering or disturbing too much the superfluid bulk. I think that this is very important because I don't want to create a massive or dramatic dis um, alteration of the bulk. Okay, so the first experiment that we ran was in fact to produce one vortex dipole and just to see how the size change during the propagation in the superfluid. And this will give us exactly access to the mutual friction coefficient, because we can just fit the trajectory, these are the vortex propag dipole propagating, using a phenomenological model that, okay, is well known like to be the dissipative point vortex model that consider vortex like point, and this is an assumption, <laughs> and consider only the longitudinal friction force, so we are not considering the perpendicular one. But this, for the moment, is an assumption that typically thinks it's fine. So it means that higher, oh, sorry, I'm just not able, this is, okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, so, is me? Oh, no, okay. Uh, higher the mutual friction coefficient alpha, and more rapidly the size of the dipole change. Okay, we expect that no friction, dipole size do not change, doesn't change, if change, shrink, accelerating, losing that in some way due to the mutual friction. And we did experiment uh, versus uh, across the BCBCS crossover. So this is the size, the initial size of the dipole versus time. We start in the BCS for larger dipole because otherwise they annihilate. So this also already tells you that if we produce two smaller dipole size in the BCS, it doesn't work, so we have to keep larger. But anyway, in, you see that the, the evolution fitted by the, the point vortex model tells you that we have a shrinking for sure very heavy in the BCS, moderate in the BC, BC in the unitary, sorry, and mild in the DC. And here I just plot the alpha coefficient versus one over KFA, and as you can see, it goes to increase very heavily if I go in the BCS. Just to tell you that this value for the mutual friction coefficient is compared with a theory of uh, Prukakis group, GP gross Pitayeski, so perfectly match what is expected. Ah. Okay, again, this is just speculation. Of course, if we go to the BCS, I, as I told you, there, are, there is the possibility that the fermionic nature can play some role. Also, and 
Now people are working on that final temperature mechanism. Can't blame another effect. So in the BCS, as you know, it's very complicated to produce, the, I mean, as, as in the other regimes, a super cold cloud. Even though we think that we consider the system is very cold as the other cases, but we see a mutual friction coefficient that is clearly larger. Okay, then of course we wanted to do another experiment that is to see what happens if I prepare two vortex dipole and just let them crash one against the other. Okay, the, so the, the physics is this one, so this is a movie, and you can see that they, they crash and they exchange patterns, in fact, as you see, and they reach the final position. Oh, well, okay, this is just a schematization. Oh, these are the trajectories. So we have vortex dipole one, vortex dipole two, they are colliding. This is, for example, a head on collision, and then we see the outcome. Of course, uh, just to tell you, if I don't have any dissipation, this is really momentum energy conservation that de define the trajectory. Okay? If I have something else, then what we expect, for example, is that the final size should be different with respect to the initial size. So I just prefer to do like this. Okay? So these are data taken from the, in the BC from uh, Idle condition, 120 degree collision, so we can produce, of course, any angle that we want. And what we just see, for just the, the, the way in which we determine if the system is dissipating is just comparing the product of the final size with respect to the initial size. Okay, this is just to give you hand waving a way to think. And this is gamma parameter versus uh, the initial size dipole in coherence length, in healing length for the BC. Just look at the upper panel. So we see that by preparing dipoles smaller and smaller and smaller, we see that gamma decrease, decrease, decrease. That means that dissipation increase, increase, increase. And what I tell you that the, what I want to tell you that this dotted line is the point vortex model that of course fails a small dipole size. While these are the gross Pitayevsky uh, uh, simulation for the yellow for the head-on, the pink for the 120 degrees from the gross Pitayevsky. And for people working in maybe in theory, this is a calculation in which tells you how the compressible kinetic term increase during this uh, change in the dipole size. That means that we are indeed, even in the simulation, observing transferring of energy from the swirling flow to the compressible energy, that means phonons. Okay, let's say, means that what happened here is probably some effect due to the phonon mode, okay, that are in the BC. Uh, so, in the lower panel, just we see the probability of annihilation, so of reducing the dipole size in a certain moment when are too small, we do not see them. I mean, we don't see any more the exit uh, channel because the dipole annihilate before or during the, the collision. We did the same experiment in uh, the unitary gas and in the BCS gas. There is no theory here. I don't have any theory. Uh, I have just compared the point vortex model that of course fails, but we can see that, you can see directly from the slope that the mechanism of dissipation is, uh, is quite strong. And also again, the probability of annihilation for both 120 and head-on collision uh, are reported. Just to tell you the sizes, of course we see that they, the effect on dissipation happens to a much higher, a larger dipole sizes. Because again, I want to tell you that the vortex core is not a point, and it's not a point for sure in the unitary and the BCS. So physics should depend on that. Uh, okay, I'm almost at the end. So um, we tried to do the experiment, starting then with dipoles that were very close and the smallest that we can before annihilation, and then launch one against the other. So what we can expect eventually is that they annihilate and sound should be emitted. Okay, is it possible to see this? Well, okay, it's possible. Um, so we start with these dipoles. They collide. And you can see here there is a strange, I mean strange, it's a round shape density ripple that then becomes eventually a spheric pattern propagating. And the propagation happens at the speed of sound. And we can see this uh, for head-on collision and 120 degree collision. And these are the, is the geogross Pitayevsky that we can do for the GP. Same mechanism we see in the unitary and BCS gas. Of course, I don't have model uh, theory, but the physics, of course, should be the same. Well, 
what do we want to do? This is a big list of things, but uh, let me just give you the details because it's something that I would say is probably very interesting for you all. So the first thing that we want to do is to take our system, go in the unitary BCS and change the temperature and study the single dipole versus uh, dissipation versus temperature. Because changing temperature means I can change the population of the underbound state, and this can, means that I can in some way see an effect that is clear. Second thing, uh, I want to engineer in vortex phonon interaction. I have in mind an experiment that maybe not now, but in, during this week we can discuss. It's very feasible because, of course, the possibility to have one vortex, I can, and we already create sound wave like Martin, other group uh, did. Uh, I can really study the impact between vortex and sound in a very controllable way. Of course, uh, that is by is gratis, I mean, I don't have to pay for that. It's in principle, as Selim Joachim is doing now in Adelberg, adding, creating one Cooper pair by one Cooper pair, I can start to add one vortex by one vortex, maybe also different size, that's fine. And then uh, approaching eventually quantum turbulence from a different point of view, I mean, adding really pieces by pieces, but just in a controllable way. And then, of course, this is something that I think that is important because it's connected also to this point. Uh, since we can, and we already did some tests, we can produce binary disorder, so this Bernoulli-like that Maciek invented uh, a few years ago, we can add in the system. So there is the possibility to pin the vortex or unpin the vortex. And since, of course, pinning energy is much lower than the chemical potential of the BC or unitary Fermi gas, I can really study how is the, the mechanism of pinning and unpinning can can happen, eventually also in presence of sound. Just the last three slides. Of course, now I completely changed topic because we have another project that we are running out that is to study persistent current. Okay, here we have the, one of the experts that uh, is uh, Bill Phillips. Uh, so we have now in our lab the possibility to create a ring shape potential. And actually we can create, a, let's say, fat ring, but also very, very small ring, okay? That is quite important because physics can really change between this. Uh, and okay, we will not enter too much in the detail, but we use the DMD to shape the ring potential. And of course, this is homogeneous. So, oh, sorry, I always do mistake on this bottom. So this is homogeneous tensor, so it's, it's quite nice, okay, from this point of view. Okay, again, using idea that were not from us, but we implemented, we use a phase imprinting technique, in fact, uh, to see how we can excite persistent current. And then we can also say how we can detect the persistent current that is using an interferometric scheme that, again, was invented by other people, just considering the fact that we can imprint uh, circulation with phase gradient in external ring and using a central ring just like a phase reference. And like, I mean, you can see that we can, in some way, okay, this is for the BC, we can see very nicely how in fact, persistent current are quantized in a very strong connection with what happened with the trapped flux in a, in a superconducting ring. Well, and this is a sort of, of course, we can do in all the regimes. And uh, I think that this, when the people show me this picture, I think that still I'm very excited because, of course, we can see BC, unitary gas, BCS showing persistent current in a very nice way. We are studying also some decay. Of this, I don't have time to show, but there is Julia's poster uh, to, tomorrow. Anyway, the lifetime of this persistent current is long as the lifetime of the system in the regimes. In the BCS, we can discuss, there is some, but we have to see also there, maybe final temperature can, can give some issue. The last slide. Of course, uh, one, once that we have the ring, we can have two ring, of course, because we can have easily this configuration. And, and so this is a, is a recent work that we are running out now, so we should be able to write uh, the paper, and but we are still trying to understand things well. What happens if I create two ring? Well, I create two ring, and I impose opposite circulation in the two ring. Okay, so I have one superfluid going plus W, and the other one minus W. And initially, they are separated by a barrier. Then I release the barrier, and I let the superfluid Mix. What happened is that, of course, uh, um, what happened is that the super, the, at the interface, a vortex lattice of same sign vortices show up. And the number of these is really twice 
the, pers the, the winding number, okay? The funny thing is that we are also very happy at this, that this situation is very stable. So despite the phasing printing can have some, but it's quite reliable, it's reliable. And the crystal has a very well-defined distribution. And the question is, we ask ourselves, what happens if we wait time, what happens to this structure? Okay, now we have the superfluid is one superfluid, and we have this ring lattice, okay, at the interface. Well, what happens is that this melts, okay? The vortex lattice melts, and for a long time, in fact, the vortex dynamics of, these are all single sign vortices, rearranged in a sort of clusterized state, more disordered phase. And then we went on trying to model this, um, and we see that uh, the, way, the grow rate, so the, the way in which it melts, follow relations that are connected to kelvin Helmholtz instability. By the way, this is probably what you expect, because there are two fluids that are touching in, in counter phase, uh, but still these are, these are, are, quanta, are quantized, are superfluids. Okay, so this will be a sort of kelvin Helmholtz observation or a superfluid kelvin Helmholtz observation. I don't know how you want to say it. Instability. But this seems that anyway is fine and happens to be valid across all the BCDs as crossover in all the regimes. This is valid. And with this, I really thank you for your attention. Wonderful talk. Let's have some questions. Oh, good. Yes, yes. This is serious. <laughs> well, it just seems better to use the microphone if you've got one. Uh, could we go back to the pictures of the collisions of the vortex anti vortex pairs? That, yeah, no, uh, yeah, one, one, yeah, the, yeah uh, no, no the, 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 the actual data. Uh, but the one that showed both that kind of collision and the one that was there, we go. Okay, so uh, the one on the left is showing two vortex, two vortex pairs colliding head on, right? And then if I've understood correctly, the, uh, the, the one on the right, the second one, shows a collision that's occurring uh, instead of uh, at 180 degrees at an angle. Yeah. And then what comes out, well, I'll pick it up later. <laughs> and what comes out is a, a pair that are going in opposite directions, which seems quite remarkable, and with different separations. Yeah. So what I'm wondering is, is that kind of collision reversible? I mean, it seems like it should be. That is, what if I collide two uh, pairs, but with different uh, dipole sizes, then do I get, uh, 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 is, is, it, is it just well, a simple reversible? I, I, is uh, it reversible as soon as we don't, we can exclude dissipation? So right, yeah. That's fine. So yeah. we, we have, we have a, in fact, I don't, I can show you later, but we have really, a figure in the paper in which you can see that the system is completely reversible. Right, so now can you give me, I mean, is there some simple way of understanding that from a, a conservation Ooh. principles or something, why it looks like this? I mean, it's such a beautiful thing. <laughs> oh, well, this I don't, I have to think about that. I must confess you. I don't have, I mean, on one side, one, one second. Okay, well anyway, good, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just hang around just in case you run out of questions so that I can ask some more. <laughs> Are there further questions? Great. Uh, so the, your collisions are in 2D, right? 2D gas. Uh, the gas is 3D. The vortex dynamics is 2D. In 3D. Yeah. Uh, okay, so there are people like in the audience, there is Gabriele, in fact, and okay, the group of Martin also see that uh, using tomographic is, is possible probably to see a reconnection, using imaging from two sides. Uh, but what we don't want here, at least uh, we tried not to have it, is to have really um, line bending. Okay, we want to have just point. 
Uh, but I agree that uh, is in principle it's possible, and I think that it's possible using uh, tomography imaging, tomographic imaging to see the reconnection. But I think Gabriele and Martin Zvilan have observed already in, um, in sodium and lithium-6. But yeah, I mean, there is no limitation for this. We can, it's the imaging that would be different. Are there further questions? <laughs> Let's play our joker then, yes, please. Okay, now, um, at the beginning you talked about using like two chopsticks, which are essentially uh, uh, dipole uh, uh, traps. What I didn't understand was why you needed two, because if you just take a single one and drag it through a superfluid, it produces a pair of vortices, or, you know, it can produce a whole bunch of pairs of vortices. What are you doing with the two? Well, I mean, for sure, if with the two, we can really control much better the size of the vortex dipole and the charge of the vortex dipole. So, for, in principle, it, for us, it's is more important, I mean, it's important, important also to control nicely the size of the vortex dipole, physically, and the angle uh -huh. of the two chopsticks will define, in fact, the size of these. Okay, so, 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 I don't think I've quite understood how the two how that the, the two dipole traps are moving. Um, <laughs> they are doing like, okay, like this. Okay, and so. And then like this. Okay, and so why don't they each form a pair? Why do the two of them just form one pair? That's what I'm not understanding. <laughs> Is it just because they're so close that? Uh, well, they are close as, as much as we want that they are close. Of course, if yeah. they are too close, they are annihilated by Sure, themselves. but if they're too far apart, they're just independent, they would produce two pairs, I would think. But well, apparently not. I think, like, <laughs> no, but I, miss, I mean, I don't, we don't try, I didn't try to do this with one. And uh, I think that for us it's important that it's very controllable, the initial size and the initial yeah. charge. But, uh, uh, and then, we need to have, uh, for sure, I agree with you that if they are super close, they should annihilate. Yeah, but one on so top, no? If, if I think of a single one shedding a pair of vortices, then is the idea that when you have a pair, that the part that shed in the middle annihilate, and then I just get the ones that are on the outside? Is that the idea? Because <laughs> that would also produce a dipole pair. Makes sense. Okay. What do you say? Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll Makes talk sense. some more. <laughs> Makes sense. Thanks. Let's thank Giacomo again for a wonderful talk. Thank you.